I now want to teach you about this very cool and important reaction, dehydrating alcohols. As it turns out, if you have an alcohol, such as this cyclohexanol, and you react it with H2SO4, that is acid and water, it will effectively remove the hydrogen adjacent to the alcohol, as well as the OH, and replace them with a double bond. Here is an example. I treat this alcohol with H2SO4 and water. The OH gets removed and forms these two alkenes. Now one question I might ask you is this. What kind of reaction does this look like? If you said an elimination reaction, you're absolutely correct. And don't worry, I'll be showing you the mechanism by which this proceeds through the ensuing example. Draw the mechanism and identify the product of this reaction shown here this alcohol treated with H2SO4 and water. As I'm going to show you the answer momentarily, if you'd like to pause the video and attempt it on your own beforehand, you're welcome to. Here's how it goes down. I've got my starting material here that interacts with an H plus source, that is my H2SO4. The lone pairs on this alcohol oxygen come out, form a bond with that hydrogen to give me this protonated intermediate. You'll notice, of course, that this is now a positively charged H2O group, which is a very good leaving group. It takes off then and gives me this carbocation. You'll notice at this stage that I can, in this case, get a 1,2 hydride shift so that hydride walks over with these two electrons, puts them into this hole, and then gives me this carbocation intermediate that has a tertiary carbocation. At this stage, this water molecule can use its lone pair electrons on the oxygen to grab a hydrogen next door, pump the electrons down into there, swinging like a door on a hinge to close and form a double bond. The isomer that I've shown here is the Z isomer. I will also get the E isomer as well. Now note that this is not the only product possible. If I, in contrast, take this intermediate, which is the same molecule shown up here, and the water instead grabs a proton off of this methyl group here and pumps the electrons down into there to form a double bond, I form this product. Now another thing that I should point out is that some of you might be thinking, well can't the water also grab a hydrogen off of this carbon right here and form a double bond between these two carbons right here? The answer is yes. However, if you look at that product closely, you'll realize that it is indeed the exact same product as this one because this carbocation intermediate is indeed symmetrical. If you don't believe me, go ahead and draw it on paper and you'll see for yourself that it's true. So this reaction, which is a dehydration reaction, forms potentially three products. This product right here, this product right here, and the E isomer, which I have not drawn. By Zaitsev's rule, of course, the two products that will be most favored will be the alkenes that are more carbon substituted, these two right here. And between the two of them, the E isomer will be the more stable. You'll notice upon looking at this sequence that a dehydration reaction really is nothing more than an elimination reaction in which the leaving group is an OH. Here are some more examples of dehydration reactions for you to practice on your own. If I take this molecule and treat it with phosphoric acid, and yes, you can do it with phosphoric acid as well as sulfuric acid, and it works just the same. What product or products am I going to form? And which of those, if there's more than one, will be the major product? And by what mechanism will it proceed? I'll let you attempt this on your own. Same question for this molecule, which is a trimethylated cycloheptanol being treated with acid and heat. This brings us to two really challenging problems that I assign my students on this problem set that I absolutely love. I'm also not going to show you the answers to these problems on this video. I will, however, work through them for my students in class and later post a video of the ensuing work. I want you to propose arrow pushing mechanisms for the following reactions. This one right here. One thing that I should point out to you is that it does involve protonating this oxygen right here and then having one of these two double bonds swing its electrons into one of these carbons. Let's see if you can figure out how that proceeds. As well as this reaction here. How in the world do I convert this starting material into this product by treatment with H2SO4 and water? Now, I know that as you look at this, you'll think that the starting materials don't look anything like the products. 
And that is what makes these reactions so cool. So as I pointed out in the past few slides, we can dehydrate alcohols, which is, once again, just an elimination of an OH, using H2SO4, H3PO4, or other strong acids. Now you might ask yourself, what if I don't want to use a strong acid? What if I don't like to use strong acids, and I've got some molecule that happens to be very sensitive to strong acids? Is there another way to remove an OH and form an alkene out of it? There is. The way that's done is by treating my alcohol with this reagent, phosphonyl chloride, or POCL3. It will do the exact same thing, except that it's a much milder way of getting there. You'll notice that there's no harsh acid, H2SO4 or H3PO4, involved. Now, if you want to know the mechanism, I'm showing it to you here. and I don't require you to know it from my students in my class. Nevertheless, I want to at least have you see it in case you're interested. The oxygen lone pair electrons pump into this phosphorus, kicking off a chloride, and give me this intermediate. At this stage, this molecule right here, which is pyridine, a mild base, comes and grabs this proton, pushing these electrons into the oxygen to neutralize its charge. And then a second molecule of pyridine comes and does an elimination, grabbing an adjacent hydrogen, pumping the electrons into here to form a carbon-carbon double bond, and kicking off this now dioxygenated phosphorus dichloride. We now come to another subject, oxidizing alcohols. Before we proceed, I want to remind you of something I've shown you in an earlier video this semester, as well as several others of my videos that I've posted on YouTube in general, organic, and biochemistry subjects. And that is, what in the world is oxidation and reduction in general? Well, as you might remember from general chemistry, generically speaking, reduction can be defined as gaining electrons, and oxidation can be defined as losing electrons. Thus, if I have a process in which an atom or substance gains electrons going from the left side of the equation to the right side of the equation, then that substance has been reduced. In contrast, if the substance loses electrons going from left to right, then it has been oxidized. We can, of course, remember that by remembering the mnemonic Leo the Lion Says Gur, which stands for losing electrons is oxidation and gaining electrons is reduction. Or we can remember oil rig. Oxidation is losing and reduction is gaining. Now one story I've told you guys in the past is that back when I was a new graduate student, I frequently saw my professors pointing at reactions and saying, as you can see, this substance has been oxidized. Or, as you can see, this substance has been reduced. And I found it very, very difficult to pick out, looking at certain reactions, whether or not something was an oxidation or a reduction. The reason is because it was challenging to see, at just a moment's glance, if something was gaining or losing electrons. Thus, I'm pointing out to you a couple of other ways that you can quickly spot reductions or oxidations, generally speaking. Other ways of spotting reductions are, if my substance gains bonds to hydrogen, loses bonds to oxygen, or loses carbon-carbon double or triple bonds. Now, that's not always 100% true all the time. Nevertheless, it is true enough most of the time that if you see that occur, going from left to right in a reaction, something gains bonds to hydrogen, or loses bonds to oxygen, or loses carbon-carbon double or triple bonds, reverting them into single bonds, then we can say that those are processes by which that molecule has been reduced. In converse, if we see the opposite trend, a molecule that gains bonds to oxygen, loses bonds to hydrogen, or gains double or triple bonds, we can say that that molecule is being oxidized. With that said as an intro, I now want to show you a couple of very important reactions that are all different ways of oxidizing alcohols. Generically speaking, you can imagine starting with an alcohol like this and treating it with some type of reagent that will increase this carbon's number of bonds to oxygen by one, giving me this type of intermediate. This type of intermediate is an aldehyde, whereas the starting material is an alcohol. Is this an oxidation or reduction? Well, as you can see, going from left to right, my substance is gaining a bond to oxygen. Thus, I can see that it is an oxidation. That is often abbreviated by writing the letter O in brackets over the arrow. Now, can this be oxidized further? You bet it can. If I replace this hydrogen with an OH, for example, 
my carbon has gone from having two total bonds to oxygen to having three total bonds to oxygen. Three is more than two. So is this also oxidation? Absolutely, because my carbon has gained bonds to oxygen. Now by comparison, what if I started with a carbon that looked like this? This is a secondary alcohol as opposed to a primary alcohol. Now I hasten to point out the difference here. In order to determine if an alcohol is a primary or a secondary alcohol, all I have to do is look at the carbon to which the OH is bonded. If that carbon is stuck to one carbon, then it's a primary alcohol. If it's stuck to two carbons, then it's a secondary alcohol. If it's stuck to three carbons, then it's a tertiary alcohol. And if it's stuck to zero carbons, then it's just a methyl alcohol. So over here, if I have a secondary alcohol, you can imagine this carbon gaining a bond to oxygen to form this type of product right here. Has this substance been oxidized or reduced? Well, you'll notice it's gained a bond to oxygen. Thus, it has been oxidized, and this is an oxidation process. This type of product is called a ketone. Ketones cannot be oxidized any further by traditional means. The reason is because in order to have an oxidation proceed, I have to be able to replace bonds to hydrogen with bonds to oxygen. Because this carbon is not bonded to any more hydrogens at this stage, both of these R groups represent carbons, I cannot oxidize this up any further. Now in that vein, we can see that if I have a tertiary alcohol, that is an alcohol in which the carbon is bonded to three separate carbon groups, and I subject it to oxidation conditions, I will get no reaction. The reason is because there are no hydrogens bonded to this central carbon to replace with bonds to oxygen. Does that make sense? In order to do an oxidation by conventional means, I have to replace a bond to hydrogen with a bond to oxygen. Here are some typical reagents that we use to do oxidations. One of them is called PCC, which just so you know, stands for pyridinium chlorochromate. You don't have to remember that name. There's another reagent called pyridinane. They are two reagents that can convert primary alcohols into aldehydes, as shown here. Here's an example primary alcohol. I've got an OH that's stuck to a carbon that's only bonded to one carbon. That is indeed a primary alcohol. If I treat that with either PCC or pyridinane, and this molecule right here, dichloromethane, is just a solvent, so we don't have to worry that much about it. It will move the total number of bonds that this carbon has to oxygen up by one. In the starting material, the carbon only has one bond to oxygen. In the product, it has two. This type of molecule is called an aldehyde. Now separately, if I treat a secondary alcohol with PCC or pyridinane, it will also do the same thing. It will increase the number of bonds that my carbon has to oxygen by one. Let's take a look at an example. You'll see here I've got a carbon that's stuck to my OH and happens to be stuck to two carbons, one up top and one down here. That is a secondary alcohol. If I treat it with PCC or pyridinane, they increase the total number of bonds that this carbon has to oxygen by one, which moves it up to this product, which is indeed a ketone. The difference between a ketone and an aldehyde, of course, is that a ketone has a carbon double bonded to an oxygen that is flanked by two carbons, whereas an aldehyde has a carbon double bonded to an oxygen that's flanked by one carbon and one hydrogen. Now, by comparison, if you treat a primary alcohol with these reagents, dihydrogen chromate, H2CrO4, or sodium dichromate, Na2Cr207, and sulfuric acid, or just chromate itself, CrO3, and sulfuric acid, it will oxidize up my alcohol by as many bonds as the carbon has bonds to hydrogen. Let me show you this. Here I have a primary alcohol. This carbon, which has one bond to oxygen, also has two separate bonds to hydrogen. It's got one bond to one of these H's and another bond to another H. If I treat it with one of these strong oxidizing agents that are stronger than PCC or pyridinate, it will strip these hydrogens and replace them with bonds to oxygen. Because I have two total bonds to hydrogen, this carbon, I end up with two new bonds to oxygen. Thus, you can see that my total number of bonds that this carbon has to oxygen goes from being one in the starting material to being three total carbon-oxygen bonds in the product. 
these types of oxidation reagents are very, very reactive and are much stronger than pyridinane or PCC. Now, by comparison, if I treat a secondary alcohol with any of these oxidizing reagents, it will also just convert it to a ketone. We go back to our same example from before. You'll notice that this carbon stuck to my OH is also bonded to two carbons, one up here and one down here. That is a secondary alcohol. If you draw it out, you'll notice that this carbon is only bonded to one hydrogen. Because it's only bonded to one hydrogen, when I react this with any type of oxidizing reagent, either PCC, pyridinane, or any of these strong oxidizing agents, it can only increase the number of bonds to oxygen by one, moving from a secondary alcohol to a ketone. So let's take a look at some examples. I want you to draw the products of each of the following reactions. Our first one is this. I've got an alcohol being treated with any of these strong oxidizing agents that I showed you in the previous slide. You'll note that this is a primary alcohol. That is, this carbon right here is bonded to two hydrogens. Because it's bonded to two hydrogens and I'm reacting it with a strong oxidizing reagent, it is going to increase the total number of bonds that this carbon has to oxygen by two. Thus, I end up with this type of product, which is called a carboxylic acid. Please note the difference between a carboxylic acid, an aldehyde, and a ketone. A carboxylic acid has a carbon double bonded to an O that is flanked on one side by an OH and on the other side by a carbon chain of some sort. An aldehyde has a carbon double bonded to an O that's flanked on one side by a hydrogen and on the other side by a carbon chain of some sort. And a ketone has a carbon double bonded to an oxygen that's flanked on both sides by carbons. Let's take a look at this second example. I've got the exact same primary alcohol being treated with PCC or pyridinane. Remember that these are milder oxidizing agents, and they will only increase the number of bonds that my carbon here has to oxygen by one. Thus, it goes from being a primary alcohol to being this type of product, which is indeed an aldehyde. All right, that seems like a great place for us to end this video. Hope it's been fun for you. Please stay tuned for our next one, in which I'll show you some more wonderful and magical reactions from chapter 10. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.